So, Dr. Amy Horneman, I am so glad to have you here today because we are going to get nitty gritty into thyroid and hormones. And, you know, like I said in my intro, Amy and I have been friends almost, I guess, right around three years, right? Are we? Yeah, about yeah, that? definitely. We're so much alike, too. I love it. Yeah, we have very similar personalities. So, I'm going to apologize now if we get a little harsh with current medical conditions and conventional medicine and what's wrong with it. Um, but So today, I really want Amy to get in and talk about, so Amy's known as the thyroid fixer, like I said in my intro, but I want to, I want to really talk about, like, what, if you were to say, what's the biggest thing that you see that's the misconception in, in our community of women, especially, about thyroid? There's so many, but what's, like, what's the one that's on the tip of your tongue right now? It's going to be that these poor women get sucked into what they are told based on a very limited amount of tests. And I know you see this in your practice too, right? The women will come to us and they'll say, well, I have the weight gain and the fatigue and the hair loss and the constipation and the frozen shoulder and the depression and the anxiety and I can't sleep, but my doctor says that I'm normal. And we look at the set of labs that their doctor did and it's like, you didn't do them all. You did TSH. You're going by one set alone. And that is it. And it's such a frustrating piece because we have been in this space so long that it's almost like it's a no brainer that you do more testing. It's just a no brainer that you listen to the patient and you listen to their complaints and you don't let them walk away thinking they're normal when they just listed 10 different symptoms. You look deeper, you test more. And that that is one thing that I will just, I will, I will plead with your listeners. I will plead with the women listening. You do not stop at normal air quotes here. You don't stop at your doctor telling you that everything is fine when you know inside that it's not. And you know your body better than anyone. You know when something is off. Yeah, I think that women's intuition is just spot on and it's, and it's frustrating because I think people get stuck and they're looking for a practitioner and they don't know where to look or who to, who to turn to. And and then, you know, they just get gaslighted and <laughs> told it's in their exactly. head and need to go somewhere else. I think, you know, there, there's the other thing that people don't really understand where those reference ranges come from. You know, when they come up with a lab, they go and grab probably a bunch of medical school, school students because they're free and cheap and easy to get. And then they go run that test and they go, OK, what's the average in the bell curve of where their numbers fall? Not are they healthy? Do they feel good? Or are they exhibiting any of those symptoms that might indicate that it doesn't work? They take the average American and do that. Well, if the average American now is overweight, moving towards obese, pre-diabetic, those ranges, regardless of what lab we're looking at, are not going to indicate an optimal health. Right. Right. And that's why I love functional medicine, because we say, give me your lean and your fit and give me the badasses that are living the best life, the 70 year olds that look like they're 50. That's who we're going to test. And that's where we're going to get our really narrow reference range of optimal. Right, right. You know, it's it's kind of like driving a car. So it, your wheels have so much air pressure until like your pressure gauge comes up and you're not you're not really at full full volume. But you can handle your car, but as somebody that loves to drive, there's a very big difference of my tires being fully inflated or not. And you're weaving all over the road and nothing really works. So, yeah, we need to be at full air <laughs> on every exactly. single tire. You know, for sure. So let's let's get into the nitty gritty. So obviously TSH is what most of the doctors run. And then if that looks OK, we don't look anymore. So 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 tell my listeners a little bit about what what the different lab values are that you really, really look at to say, OK, these are these ranges. These are the percentages I want to see. Definitely. So, yeah, like you said, Betty, we start with TSH. And that's just standard of care. And the analogy that I use for TSH when your doctor's looking at it, it's like if you have a couple feet of water in your basement and you call a plumber and he comes in and he goes to your kitchen and he looks in the sink and he's like, well, there's no water spewing out of your sink here. So not a problem. And you're like, wait a minute, there's something going on here. Can we look deeper? Can you maybe go down in the basement and see the two feet of water that's down there? But if water was spewing out of your sink, if that TSH is screaming at your doctor, then they'll stop and go, hey, there's a problem. Well, what if there's something going on beneath the surface? What if there's more to look at? What if you got to go downstairs and look at the two feet of water in the basement? 
Those are the other tests. That's where you get into total and free T4, total and free T3. And those two of those tests, the free version is the most important. I want to know how much free unbound thyroid hormone is in your body at any given time. And then I really want to hone in on that T3 because T3 is the active thyroid hormone. And many people don't realize they, you know, we hear this T4, T3 talk. If you're listening to the podcast, or even if maybe you got your T4 tested by your doctor and it was normal too. And you think, well, that's my thyroid hormone. That's normal. T4 is completely inactive. You do not have one single receptor site on a cell for T4. It has to convert over and become active. It has to become T3. So that's where the receptor sites on our cells are. It, it, they, the receptor site wants T3 as a lock and key to come in, to attach, and to do its job at the cell level, to give you a metabolism, to grow your hair, to give you great energy, to improve your mood, to let you poop every day. You need that T3. So that's a very, very important marker. Then as we go down the line, there's reverse T3. Now, this is very important because reverse T3 is the antithyroid hormone. And it's it's a marker that is beautifully built into our body as a survival mechanism. Our bodies know that if you were in an accident, if you're in a state of of, of trauma or sepsis, or you're in the ICU or the ER, that reverse T3 is going to go up to protect you because our bodies know that when you're fighting for your life, you don't need to burn fat. You don't need to, to grow your hair. You don't need to really even have energy. You just need to lay there and survive and let your body focus on the healing. Here's the problem. If reverse T3 is elevated when you're running a business, taking the kids to school, going to the grocery store, living life, trying to do things during the day and your body's in survival mode, that's not good. And reverse T3 is also an indicator of how well you're converting that inactive thyroid hormone over into the active thyroid hormone. It is vital. Do not let your doctor tell you that it's not an important test. What you'll hear is we only test that in the clinical setting, meaning if you're in the ICU or the ER and you're fighting for your life, well, yeah, no, duh, you're going to test and it's going to be high in that situation. Now let's test it in day-to-day -day life and see where it's at. And then one step further, we're going to go for the TPO and TGA antibodies because I want to know if you have Hashimoto's and many people, I'm sure you see this too, Betty, many people come and they go, well, I don't have Hashimoto's. And we look at the tests and TPO, let's say one lab has the standard lab value range as less than 30, less than 35. And you're rolling in at a 20. No, you don't have Hashimoto's. Well, you have 20 antibodies. You're going to wait until you get some more antibodies where you're actually given that official diagnosis on the test. Or are we going to look at that and do something about it? Because, hey, you as a person are also coming in with symptoms. So it's, it's test everything, pair that up with the person's symptoms to get that beautiful full picture of who you are and what's going on inside your body. Absolutely. You know, it's uh, very frustrating to me when I have somebody come in and they're like, I've, you know, I've been hypothyroid for a while, you know, and I'm like, is it Hashimoto's? So like, oh, no. You know, I'm like, have you ever been tested for Hashimoto's? Because the right. trajectory of what we may do is going to be different if it's autoimmune. I mean, I've, I've been hypothyroid, finally diagnosed about 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, similar problem. My TSH looked completely normal because the coach was not aware there was a problem down the field. Right. Yep. So yep. No, no yelling at me that day. Right. And, um, you know, I, looking for Hashimoto's, I have never had Hashimoto's. So my thyroid peroxidase antibodies are normal. My antithyroglobulin ant antibodies were normal. But lo and behold, when I got COVID and you and I were in the same place where I got yes. COVID. <laughs> Right after that, of course, I use myself as a guinea pig. So I, I run labs immediately. I'm like, what did it do? And lo and behold, my antithyroglobulin antibody was high for the first time. Yep. And it was high for a while. I mean, it took about six months of like, okay, let's reel it in, just be a little more clean. Not that I'm not clean to begin with, but you know, you always kind of pull those reins a little tighter because people think, oh, if it, I wasn't Hashimoto's a year ago, I can't be now. And it's an mm -hmm. epidemic. So talk to me about that, because I know you see it, how big the uh, epidemic is. So much, so much. So I'm very similar to you. And I think a, a lot of the times healthy individuals who have been taking care of themselves for years, if not decades, 
are not going to show positive for Hashimoto's, even if it is. So with Hashimoto's, we know that as an autoimmune condition, there's a stressor, there's a trigger. It could be something as simple as pregnancy. And ladies, I know that pregnancy is totally natural, but it is a huge stress on the body. Any kind of hormonal changes, perimenopause, menopause, that is enough of a stress on the body to flip the switch and then hello autoimmune. Well, same thing with COVID. And we are seeing this across the board that COVID in and of itself is such a stressor on the body and God knows what else it's doing in there that that many people are getting antibody markers for the very first time. Now, you most likely had the genetic predisposition for autoimmune and it was probably just kind of sitting there dormant. And yes, your thyroid was starting to get a little wonky and you discovered that you had low thyroid function years ago, but you're gluten free. You take care of yourself. You do all the things. You address heavy metals. You address mold. That's what you're doing with your patients. So of course, you're not going to show positive for antibodies until you got punched in the face with a huge stressor. And then there they were. Yeah. And, you know, it's a, it's such a multifaceted problem, autoimmunity, and so much is overlooked, you know, because the, the end result is, well, whatever your labs are, who cares what really caused it. So, um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's interesting because I remember when I started my practice in 2005, you know, I would see Hashimoto's here and there, but now it's pretty much a given that two thirds of the people walking in are like, yeah, right. that's part of the problem. So it's just a right. total epidemic. So let's, let's circle back because you've been doing some research specifically into T2. And I'd like to get into that because I guarantee you probably the majority of people who are going to listen to this podcast didn't even know there was a T2 right. and more or less what it does. Right. So we talked about T4 and T3 as the two thyroid hormones. Well, there's also one and two. So there's T1 and T2. T1 is, is very inactive. We kind of don't even pay attention to it. It's just there. T2, when you really start diving into the research, is very active. And it works to increase your basal metabolic rate, meaning the amount of fat and energy that you are burning just sitting here. It also works at the mitochondrial level. And when it's working at the mitochondrial level, the benefit of that is obviously improved ATP production, improved energy, but also no thyromimetic effects. So you're not going to be taking something that then will cause you to appear hyperthyroid on your labs where maybe your doctor starts freaking out and says, oh my gosh, you need to drop your medication and you're, you're all hyper and maybe, God forbid, they put you on a medication to slow your thyroid down. That is what can happen with direct thyroid hormone replacement. Now, I'm not against thyroid hormone replacement. I am not at all. But when we're trying to get someone into an optimized state and we're using T2, the beauty of that is that it does not change the thyroid lab values. It has no cardiovascular side effects. So we do know that T3 can, in some individuals, cause a little bit of heart palpitation. Some people are very sensitive to it. They'll get a little bit of tachycardia. They'll get a bit of anxiety from it. T2 doesn't do that. It has no cardiovascular side effects. So I go back to, and I know you'll resonate with this, Betty. I go back to the bodybuilders because they are the OGs of biohacking. Bodybuilders will always try something on themselves long before it comes into the general population or even the biohacking population. And it was interesting years ago, and this is going back about 15 years that I've been really studying T2 and kind of using it with my patients. I heard it was one of the trainers to, you know, the IFBB pros. And he was on and he was saying, you know, and, and T3 can be abused in that in that world because T3 will increase your metabolism, right? He was saying, you know, I do not allow my female figure and and fitness and bodybuilding athletes to use T3 because number one, they're going to come out the other side and they're going to tank their own thyroid. So then they will have to be on thyroid medication because now you've you've gotten into that negative feedback loop where the thyroid has just shut down because you abused something that you didn't need. Number two, T3 has, it doesn't differentiate between burning fat and burning muscle. So some of the women that were taking it would end up losing muscle. And that's not what you want going into a competition. You want to protect your lean body mass and only burn fat. He goes, I use T2 instead of T3. 
because I know if I use T2, it's just going to burn body fat. It's going to protect their muscle and it's not going to shut down their thyroid function. And he's using it anecdotally, but we see all of that evidence in the, in the limited amount of studies that's been done with T2. We do see that in the evidence. So it's really fascinating when you look at it. And now that I'm using it with patients, we really are seeing some people being able to come not completely off their thyroid medication, but at least knock the dose down. They're, they're getting a win. They're feeling better. Their clothes are fitting better. Their energy is better. And they're noticing it pretty quickly. So it really is a beautiful piece of the puzzle in, in thyroid treatment because you can really improve someone's condition very quickly and get them out of that deep thyroid hole. That's awesome. That's awesome. You know, it's, it's interesting because you just, as you were saying that, I was like, there's, you know, there's all the different thyroid medications, right? There's everything from there. So do you have a preference of what people use? Obviously, if you could use T2 and everybody, you would probably use T2. But when it comes to the medication itself, what are your thoughts on that? Like, what's, what should somebody start with? You know, it's all about what's going to work for you. There's no, I don't come into, even though I'm functional, I don't, I'm not locked into the natural desiccated thyroid meds just because it has the word natural before it. I want what's going to work for you. And the beauty of it is that we can do any combination and we can change ratios based on your labs, based on how your body responds. So I'll give you an example. I am T3 only because I don't convert. Now it took me a while to figure that out. So I started, of course, as all of us do on Synthroid, which that's what led me into this whole arena because T4 only did not work and usually doesn't work for most people. And then I moved into the NDT. So I was on armor for quite some time and it worked in the beginning much better than just Synthroid, but then it kind of stopped working and it was back when we were having shortages of armor in 2006, 2005. So my, my functional doctor that is my mentor changed me over to Synthroid and Cytomel. So I was doing T4 and T3 separately. And that was fine, but it turned out that I wasn't improving like I should be. So God love him, brilliant man, says, you know what? The reverse T3 isn't high here, but let's just drop that T4. And I dropped it and I got better. And then we, we would self-experiment. So I put it back in and then do some testing on myself and see, well, did the reverse go up? No, it didn't but I went hypo, like within a week I would go hypo. So I am ultimately T3 only. So I can't, I can't sit here and say, oh, I only like NDT because that wouldn't work for me. I wouldn't be sitting here with you if I was on NDT, I'd be in bed still in a hypo state, probably 20 pounds heavier. So it's all about what's gonna work for you. Yeah, definitely. I've, I've definitely did the kind of merry-go-round of medication management for a long, long time. Now that brings me to another point, because I know you and I have very similar thoughts about this. A lot of people, even if they get lucky and they're like, oh my gosh, my doctor actually gave me maybe T4 and a compounded T3 or Synthroid and Cytomel, which is Cytomel is basically the over the, or not over the counter, but prescriptive version of a, of a T3 that right. can be easily prescribed. Never right. mind the fact that most doctors don't do it. <laughs> But, but then they go to get tested, right? Because the doctor's then like, okay, we need to check it. So what are your recommendations around that? Because T3 is fast acting relative to T4 and you have to be careful or otherwise they're just going to mess with your prescription again. Yes, yes. So I, I see this all the time too. In my Facebook group, there are people that are posting, well, my doctor told me to take it right before I went and got my labs done. And the problem with that is, T3 is, well, T4 and T3 is like the tortoise and the hare. T4 is the tortoise. It's, it's working really slowly in your body. T3 is fast. It is in, it does its job, and then it is out. Now, does some still remain after you're taking it for a while? Yeah. That's why we're not testing you on day two of changing your medication. We're testing you four weeks later as it starts to build up in your system. But my rule is 18 to 24 hours of no thyroid medication containing T3. So that's Cytomel, Lyothyronine means the generic form of T3. NDT has T3 in it. So you stop that 18 to 24 hours before your labs. 
And then you stay consistent with that time. So if it's 18 hours, this lab draw, it's 18 hours, next lab draw. And then we can see instead of the lab picking up on the medication essentially in your bloodstream, it's picking up on what's left over when that medication isn't pulsing right after you take it, what's left over and where's your number there? Because that's where I want to see you have a, an optimal T3 level because that's where you're going to feel your best. If it's plummeting down to a 2.3 at the 18 hour mark, you need more T3. Absolutely. You know, cause I, I, I do see that so much. Someone was like, yay, I'm finally feeling better. I'm getting, I'm getting the hormones that I need. And then the doctor's like, oh my gosh, that's too high. Now we're going to just draw it, take it back. And then you're like, oh, I'm back at square one. Oh yeah. The docs will drop it if it's high. And, and you and I can almost spot it every time, you know, somebody will post their labs in, in my group and T3 will be, you know, 6.2. And I go, how long did you go? between you you took this right before you went to the lab didn't you or right when you went up and then you rolled the lab three hours later they're like yeah I'm like that's why it's high you're not actually high in fact if you're rolling in at a 6.2 or 6.5 four hours post medication you're you probably are only like a 2.3 you're well below the optimal range of where I want to see you Absolutely. So what's the, I mean, obviously you listed off a lot of the symptoms that, you know, people think about hair loss. Like that's a biggie for me. If my thyroid's off, I will lose hair like nobody's business. That's like my litmus test for everything. You know? yep. And anybody that listens to my podcast, you know, I had a whole podcast on hair loss in women. Um, so for me, that's a litmus test and obviously the constipation, the dry skin. What are some of the other things that maybe people don't think about that, can be part of the underlying cause for thyroid problems. Like what are some of the other things that you see? And then people are like, Oh, I didn't know that could play a role in my thyroid. Mm -hmm. So joint pain and frozen shoulders, a big one. And I'll give you the example of my, my assistant who was, who started as a patient. We started working together and she didn't even mention that she had joint pain because she chalked it up to she was getting older or overuse and she was a teacher and her joints hurt on her on her hands from holding it you know whatever and then we started optimizing her thyroid and she tells me later she goes you know I used to not even be able to hold a pencil because my joints hurt so badly in my hand and now that's gone it's just gone it's fine so whenever I'm meeting with someone and we're going over their symptoms I always tell them listen this could be thyroid related, or maybe it isn't. Maybe it is overuse. Maybe it is an old sports injury. But guess what? If it gets better when we optimize your thyroid, hello, bonus. So I'm not saying that everything under the sun is thyroid related, but since the thyroid is the master gland, there are many different things that can be going on in your body that will improve once we optimize your thyroid, I mean, think about the Band-Aid medications that people are given. They're given antidepressants, sleeping pills, blood pressure medications, statins, and those are all Band-Aids to, there's something going on with your thyroid. There's something going on with your thyroid. And I'll tell you one more story. I was on the phone with my sister last night. She is a, a geriatric physician. And she is, her and I are very, very different, but she... She's a DO, so she's a little bit more on our side, right? She was trained many, many years ago. She's older than I am. And she was telling me the story about a patient that came in, in her 60s. And the referring physician had indicated on her chart early Alzheimer's. And my sister was looking at her thyroid labs. Her TSH was a 10. And she went back to the referring physician and said, um, this isn't early Alzheimer's. This is thyroid. And how about we just give her some NDT because what's it going to hurt? Either her brain's going to come back and light up again, or it's not. And we go down another pathway for treating early Alzheimer's. But with a TSH of a 10, there's a really, really big possibility that it's thyroid related because thyroid will also cause brain fog and depression and anxiety. And I have had patients say, come to me and say, they think that they are in early stages of dementia or Alzheimer's because of how their brain is functioning and they're not, they're just not. Oh yeah. I know I see it a lot because you know, estrogen, cause I'm always really harping on the fact that all these hormones work together. And especially as we enter into perimenopause and menopause, the loss of all of our, 
you know, really, really important sex hormones, one of the most common symptoms is going to be mood changes and cognitive decline in women. All of a sudden, we can't remember where our keys are. We don't remember somebody's name. And, and we're depressed and anxious and all those other things. And, you know, the conventional medic, medical answer is you're just antidepressant deficient. And, right. And it, which is just complete and utter crap. Right. You know, and the synthetic hormones that we say are okay for birth control are fine until the day you go into menopause and you stop having your period. And then those things are dangerous and hell as hell. And they're going to give you breast cancer and you're going to die, which is insane to me. I'm like, oh, was that a master? Like, oh, just a cutoff point? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> so there's so many other symptoms. And I think the other thing is, is especially if somebody's autoimmune, they're going to have flares, right? So something that may have been somewhat managed needs to be consistently managed because people's stress is different. Their gut bugs are going to be different. You know, they're going to do something that's going to set off a cascade that may cause the thyroid to go sideways. Yep. Yep. And life is always changing. Our hormones are always changing. Even if you're in menopause, hopefully you're on some kind of bioidentical hormone replacement in menopause, but if you're in menopause, your hormones are still shifting. It's not like, oh, hormones are done after menopause. That's it. I'm going to be the same hormone level the rest of my life. No, you're always having those hormonal shifts. Life happens, cortisol spikes, stress happens. Anything can throw off your thyroid. So you really need to be on top of it and be listening to your own body for those signals so that you can be working with someone that can make that adjustment so you don't go down the deep, deep hypothyroid hole. And then, you know, now you're 20 pounds heavier, you're tired, you've lost hair, and then you're crying for help saying, hey, I think something's wrong here. Maybe we need to change my dose or something. Absolutely. Now, this is another topic area that I know you and I are very much hot, <laughs> hot on as far as what, you know, what women need is the idea that women don't really need testosterone and that it's not an important hormone for us, which is insane. insane. And, you know, I had, I had a patient tell me the other day, well, the FDA hasn't approved testosterone for women. And I said, well, it hasn't approved said injectable vax. They approved it for emergency, emergency use, but it has never gone through FDA approval, but yet we are prescribing it freely. So at the end of the day, just because the FDA hasn't ordained it so, doesn't mean that it's not an important hormone. So tell me your thoughts on that. What do you think about testosterone and what do you see? Yeah, if we were giving testosterone injections along with like free donuts and puppies like we have for the last two years, I think the world would be a better place. Actually, immune systems would be up. Because low testosterone is a huge contributor to that Hashimoto switch flipping on. That's why more women have Hashimoto's than men, because we have just in general less testosterone than a man. However, testosterone is the most abundant hormone in a woman's body. And, you know, you say that to a woman, they're like, what? I thought that was a male hormone. It's like, no, you it's it's your hormone. It is a you hormone, girl. And you need enough of it in order to have motivation. So I call it the GSD hormone, the get shit done hormone. You can bleep me out if you need to, but I think that you're probably, you guys are probably, yeah, <laughs> your listeners are used to this. It, it, it gives you the motivation to keep going. It gives you, it's not just about sex drive. Testosterone is not just about libido. It is about having that motivation to go for a walk, to go to the gym, to get things done during the day to burn body fat, to have that lean, sexy muscle that is more metabolically active that then protects your bones. Testosterone protects your heart. Testosterone protects your brain. It improves your mood. It does not make you aggressive. It actually balances you out. So testosterone in, in both males and females, vital and hugely overlooked in the medical system. Number one, because yes, prescribers They've listed testosterone in the same category as pain medicine. You need a DEA license to be able to prescribe testosterone. Now, why? You can pres we can prescribe estrogen and progesterone without a DEA license. We can't prescribe testosterone, and that's going to save people's lives. Of course, my theory is because testosterone would be getting you off of statins, getting you off of blood pressure medications, getting you off of antidepressants getting you off of all the Band-Aid medications, along with when you improve the thyroid, that helps too. But testosterone's a biggie. And, and both sexes get overlooked when it comes to that hormone. 
Yeah, I think they classified it in those kind of controlled substances because because our, our friends in the bodybuilding community, of which Amy and I have spent some time in years ago, um, were early biohackers using, you know, maybe not what would be considered human use <laughs> right. hormones. And so then all of a sudden we classified these as something people shouldn't use. And I, and, I th- and I think the other side is when people are looking at labs, we're using a different unit of measure when we're looking at testosterone. So the lab values are going to be relatively low compared to when you look at your estradiol levels. But it's because it's looking, it's like the difference between looking at gallons and cups. Like we have yeah. four gallons and we have 22 cups. Like, okay, there's a difference. So... You right. know, I think that's so important and so overlooked. And I know a lot of women are always worried about, well, if I'm on testosterone, I'm going to grow a beard and lose my hair and, right. you know, or, and ro- roid rage. And I can tell you, if I, if, if I don't keep my hormones after menopause in balance, what's really crazy is I'm the most even keeled person you'll ever meet. I'm the one that you want around when the shit hits the fan and somebody needs to get it together because I, I am in like pure form when there's like chaos yep. and I'm also mellow I, for me to show true anger and like show it visibly I have to be so mad that I'm just I'm just losing my mind which is so mm-hmm. rare but I can tell you when my testosterone runs out I wake up and I am so bent like I I am angry at being awake I'm angry at my husband making me coffee like what's up with that I should be super thrilled and I'm angry at everybody and mm-hmm. I'm always like oh my god I need to get back on my hormones like yesterday or I'm gonna be just a raising just crazy raging person yeah yeah you know, so it's the exact opposite the exact opposite for me for sure and I will say this you know there's some companies that have been doing hormone replacement for quite a while and one of them I, w- I want to say it was la- in 2020 actually put out a retrospective study looking at hormone replacement specifically testosterone in women because of course that's the argument we've never studied it I'm like actually some of these companies have been doing it for a very long time they have a lot of aggregate data and they showed over a million, over a million procedures for th- uh, for testosterone replacement, and the incidence of breast cancer, cardiovascular disease, stroke, osteoporosis, all those things were reduced in that yep. population over a ten year period. So it's it's just you know the the that bus of trying to get what's in the literature into clinical practice takes a good 17, 18 years. And so we have basically two entire generations of women that are going to go through basically falling apart early just because we aren't getting the data out there fast enough. And we're not negating the Women's Health Initiative study. It wasn't looking at testosterone. I know we're talking about testosterone, but when you're talking about studies, we still have women and doctors believing the WHI study that was the most expensive, worst done study ever to date. We we already know that we can just kind of push it aside and, and, and erase that data. It, it's bad but we're still holding on to it. So I have an idea. Let's hold on to that study that Betty just talked about where using testosterone actually lowers the incidence of all cause mortality and diseases of aging. Let's, let's, let's look at that with, and, and go through it with a fine tooth comb and actually start implementing it. Absolutely. You know, (laughs) yeah, I I have my soapbox on that one. I have like drug behind my car and stood on a corner. (laughs) Oh yeah, so much about what's wrong with that. And I, you know, going back to the testosterone too, I think women don't realize that as we're going through perimenopause and our and our estrogen levels are fluctuating and then we hit menopause and they sort of take that cliff dive, we aromatize, we make estradiol out of testosterone. So you know your testosterone is already tanked. Like it's not a question of if it is. Right. And it's just, yeah, it's just mind boggling. So I want to go, I want to go back. So we've talked a lot about thyroid issues and having, you know, having somebody that really identifies and tests and, you know, really does the deep dive to figure out what's going on and obviously a, a, appropriately monitoring it. So it's not, thyroid's not something that you would say, hey, you know, get your labs done once they got the hormone in there and it, your labs look good, let's play. What's your recommendations? How often should somebody kind of monitor their levels? Cause that's important too. It is. It is. So when you're first starting off and you're, you're just starting to work with someone that is knowledgeable with the thyroid and they're getting you optimized. So I'll just, I'll use my patients as an example. They're starting off. We're starting from scratch, right? Their metabolism is in the tank. We are literally rebuilding their thyroid hormones right off the bat. We're going to do a couple dose changes. 
Because if we're starting you on T3, we're going to go up nice and slow. We're going to see how you tolerate it. Then we're going to retest. Then we're going to go up again until we hit that really nice sweet spot where your symptoms are reduced and the labs look good too. That might take a test every four weeks for a few months. And then once you're in that groove and things are really good and you're like, I feel great. And I go, well, Susie, your labs look great too. So let's put a place marker, maybe at the eight to 12 week mark. And if something goes awry, if you start to feel like garbage, if you're like, oh my gosh, all of my symptoms are coming back, we can always test sooner, but we can put that place mark there so that we know, hey, this is when we're gonna check again. And then if you get to the place where I'm at, I test my thyroid twice a year, unless I start to feel wonky, right? Unless I start to all of a sudden gain weight and then get fatigued. And like you said, start to lose hair, then I'm gonna retest. I can test at any time, but I'm gonna put that place marker for twice a year. It's good, I'm optimized, I'm fine. So it's really individualized. And it's kind of where you are in your journey. Yeah, I think that's important because, you know, so many people go, I need to see an endocrinologist. And I'm like, "Mm, probably not. (laughs) Because number one, most endocrinologists want to specialize in brittle diabetics. They don't want to deal with a thyroid patient that is symptomatic but doesn't fall within the range. And then even if they do see them, often they're going to test them that one time. If they get lucky, they'll get their labs done appropriately in all the right labs. But they're probably not going to see them for another year because the conventional medical system is kind of like you get your five minutes once a year. That's it. And so they're really poorly managed in my experience, really poorly managed. And so that's not always the best route because like you said, especially in the beginning, there's a lot of tweaking and there's a lot of looking at that person's symptoms. Like we always talk about treat the patient, not the numbers. Mm -hmm. The numbers are important for monitoring and identifying, but it's the person in front of you and what their symptoms are. Oh, a hundred percent. And it goes the other way too, that even just last week, I had a patient with a free T3 that was lower than what my optimal is. She was coming in at like a 2.9. I really like in most lab value ranges, 3.5 or above, or I can just say in that upper quadrant of the range in case you're in a different country or go to a different lab. And she's great. I mean, great. I mean, she is like singing praises. And so in that case, I'm not touching anything. I'm not changing a thing. I don't care that that number is a little bit lower than what I want it to be because the patient is feeling good. We don't change it if it's not broken. So it really, it's very, it's it's even heavier weighted on how the patient feels, how that person feels. Yeah, I think that's important because as somebody that's always struggled with that T3 conversion, I feel like right now just as good at a 2.8 as I did at a 3.8. And, and it's, it's probably because the saturation's working very well with my receptors and it's doing its thing. So it's not necessarily that, that, you know, 3.8 and above range is going to radically make you feel different because I know it sounds like your experience was similar. I had been given so many different forms of thyroid medication, so many different like levels of, you know, this much, this much, this much, this little bit. And, and really, I didn't see the T3 radically change until I kind of balanced out where I am now. And a lot of it is, I think it's just the receptors and everything's working better and I don't need it because my symptoms are not present. Mm-hmm. Yep, exactly. You know, so, so now that we've kind of identified all these things that people are struggling with and, you know, where they need to sort of look and do, what are, you know, what are some things that you could tell my listeners like, hey, here's, here's outside of the labs they need to look at, here's some things to think about or things that you may be able to try over the counter. Like I know you have some products that are awesome. Like what things can they sort of try on their own while they try and figure out, you know, where to go to get real help. And obviously you help people. So that's why I have Amy on the show, everybody. She's the thyroid fixer. So let's, let's talk about like some general recommendations. Where can they, where can they can do? Yeah, no, definitely. So there are some key nutrients that the thyroid needs. So we talked about that T4 to T3 conversion and we want reverse T3 in the optimal range. So in order for that to occur, we need some simple things like zinc, magnesium, a little bit of selenium. Do not go overboard on selenium because you read it on a thyroid blog. For God's sake, I have people mega dosing selenium because they think it's going to heal their thyroid. A little bit of selenium, a little bit of iodine. I am a fan of iodine in small amounts, not these huge doses that are sending people into a thyroid storm, but just enough because your body needs, your thyroid needs iodine. 
all of your cells need iodine. So a little bit of iodine and we want your vitamin D levels optimal. And then we can move into T2. So yes, thank you for mentioning. I do have a product that's called Thyroid Fixer. Again, 15 years in the making. I, I was using T2 with my patients 15 years ago and finally got to the point where there's been enough studies out. There's human trials out that used it. There are no tests, by the way, for T2, because I know that's going to be a big question. Well, can I get my T2 levels tested? They had the assay, obviously, for the studies, but they don't have it for the general population for us to check it on you. But because of the safety profile, I feel comfortable putting people on it and recommending it to even people that aren't my patients. That's why I, I brought it to market in the thyroid fixer because it worst case scenario, you're not you're gonna take it too late in the day, and maybe you won't sleep, you know, because it is kind of increasing your energy and not in a stimulant way, but in a in a working at the mitochondrial level way. So all of a sudden you're like, whoa, I just have this really good steady energy. So that's why I tell people take it in the beginning of the day. You can take it all at once. You can split dose it like we do thyroid medication. People without thyroid problems can take it because it's just going to increase your basal metabolic rate and even kind of help you through perimenopause and menopause where the thyroid tends to take a beating and tends to at least slow down. Even if you don't go into a hypothyroid state, it slows down. So it's it's really safe for everyone. And who doesn't want a better basal metabolic rate? We all want better metabolisms, right? So I would say that, you know, get get with the core basic nutrients, minerals, elements like iodine, and then add in some T2. And then even if you are stuck on T4 only, and you're like I was where nothing was happening, no pounds lost, no energy gained, hair not growing back, that actually might help you just doing those little things, adding in those little key components might be enough to just let you see the light, give you some hope that things can change so that you're not just stuck in that depressive hypo state. Absolutely. Now you mentioned something. So I think it's important because I, I know in the functional medicine community, this is a, a, a common recommendation, but I, I would say my patients, I see it a lot where they aren't doing it because it's not convenient. Talking about trickle dosing throughout the day, especially if it's T3, yeah. they'll go, oh, I took it in the morning, but I keep forgetting the afternoon one. And I'm, I can't, I'm just so tired in the afternoon. Duh. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about it. So we talked earlier about when we test T3. And so T3 is very fast acting, like we said. It's important to at least split dose it. Some people will triple dose it. Some people can get away with just split dosing it. But taking it once in the morning on an empty stomach, no food, no coffee, no other supplements for one hour afterwards. And the same rule applies to T4 as well. So those of you that are maybe just on Synthroid or just on Levo, you still have to apply that rule because we want proper absorption of your thyroid medication. I want you getting as much out of that med as we possibly can. So when you're taking it with food, when you're taking it with coffee, which is a known like deregulator of the, the thyroid hormone being absorbed in your, in your gut, it's going to decrease absorption. But here's the thing with T3, we have to put it in the, in the middle of the day. I mean, you can put it between 1 and 3 p.m. Some people can get away with taking it at 6 p.m. But if you take that second dose, now you're giving your body that extra T3 that has not worn off from the morning dose. And you get a little bit better energy. You, 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 you give a little bit of a kick to your metabolism in the afternoon too. So I, I know I have patients like that too. I keep forgetting. I go, you know, there's this thing called the phone that you can set an alarm on to remind you to take your second dose, it's that easy and it's that important. So if you actually want results and you wanna feel better, it really is as simple as split dosing. And I don't know about you, Betty, but I've even had some people, I'll talk to them for the first time and I'll say, well, you know, maybe we're not meeting for a couple of months, but number one, split th dose that NDT. Did anybody tell you that that 90 milligrams should probably be 45 and 45? No, they didn't. Start doing that, let me know how you feel. They come back, they go, you know, just that change alone. I started feeling better. Just that change alone, just split dosing. Yeah, it's like taking a sledgehammer. So if the dose is too high all at once, you, you get this sort of roller coaster because that T3 is very short. It's got a very short half-life. So it's, mm -hmm. it's going to run through you. But, you know, sustaining the energy is so very important, you know, and sustaining the effect. Yeah. So, so... 
I want to touch on this real quickly because obviously we're both nutrition professionals, you know, so obviously we recommend gluten-free even if you don't have Hashimoto's because <laughs> we want to avoid having Hashimoto's. What would you say? I mean, I know that you, you have particular diets that you work on with your people and obviously you personalize it to the ones that you are helping with your thyroid. But what are like three other things that someone listening to this is like, okay, I've been on thyroid or I think I got a thyroid problem. Maybe they're doing the standard American diet and this is kind of new. What would you tell them to do? Yeah. So, I mean, this is so cliche, but like, like you said, number one is to remove gluten. And, and I try to drive home the point that it's not, it's not this fad diet thing. I think it really got a bad rap years ago when the gluten-free phase fad kind of came out and the grocery stores were picking up on it and manufacturers were producing gluten-free pretzels and gluten-free cookies and gluten-free crackers and gluten-free bread. And everybody ran out and they replaced their bread, Schwabel's bread, with gluten-free bread. And it wasn't a great swap. When everything in your pantry has a gluten-free label on it, you're still taking in inflammatory food. You're still taking in inflammatory ingredients. There is still sugar in that. Gluten-free does not mean low carb. So you still saw these huge spikes in insulin. You still saw these huge spikes in inflammation. And people were saying, well, this gluten-free BS, I'm not feeling any better. Why even do it? And they're not noticing of what's going on beneath the surface that they're still inflamed. They're not going to notice the benefit of going gluten-free when they're still inflamed because of all the processed foods that they're taking in. So when you go gluten-free, you have to go real food gluten-free. Now, listen, if you want up once a week, you're like, ah, it's pasta night, you know, and my family's having pasta and I got to make my gluten-free pasta. Yeah, do that and go ahead and enjoy the pasta and have your gluten-free version. That's fine. But then the rest of the time should be real food, real food. And that's, that's just huge for me. It's just really focusing on non-man-made food products, real food. And then the other thing I always say is your labs tell us how you should eat. So there's no one size fits all. But I see in hypothyroid Hashimoto patients about 90% of the time insulin resistance. Because the thyroid is the master gland, it starts to have an effect on the other hormones. And horm insulin is a hormone. So even if a person comes in and they're eating beautifully, clean, whole foods. They're getting in great sources of protein. They're grass-fed meats. They're gluten-free, like really gluten-free. But their thyroid is off. Now their insulin's off. And we're seeing this insulin-resistant state. And they still can't lose weight. So yeah, we're going to optimize the thyroid here, but we're also going to be focusing on that insulin resistance. So maybe we do back off on the carbohydrates a little bit, get you doing some carb cycling or get you, get you into a low carbohydrate diet so that we can lower the insulin. We can balance that out. And then everything works together. Maybe we sprinkle in some berberine, you know, we, we, we tell you to go for a walk after dinner. We make sure that you're lifting heavy at the gym and all of that will improve your insulin resistance. But you always have to go back to the labs. You always have to look at the labs because that's how we're going to tell really what your macronutrients are. And I can even tell if you're not eating enough protein from your labs, which most, most women aren't, as you know. So that's another big one too, is adequate amounts of protein, gluten-free, real foods, nothing processed. And look at your insulin and your A1C levels to see if you're insulin resistant, because you might have to pull back on the carbohydrate intake a little bit. I'm so glad you brought up the relationship with insulin. <clears throat> You know, because I, I run into so many women who, A, number one, let's say they're finally getting their thyroid corrected and they're taking thyroid and they think, oh, I've had the magic pill and everything's going to go to normal and nothing really changes, let's say. You know, but yeah. their thyroid's looking good. You've got the yep. right levels. Everything looks good. And and that there is often kind of like a pe peeling back the layer of an onion and we got to peel it back and everybody's a little different. Some people get, you know, they get the lucky gene and, you know, they just get the thyroid dialed in and everything's like glorious and the sun just broke out of the clouds. And you could be like me where that onion was a big onion and I had to keep peeling and peeling. So it's this expectation that something magical is going to happen. 
And that often, even if you're doing all the right things, there's some piece that's missing, which you know, you and I and other functional medicine and nutrition professionals, that's where we shine because we keep digging because there is something that's not working. <laughs> right. And, it, and right. it is important. It's not, you know, one size doesn't fit all. And, and just because you're doing what looks right and what you've read about, it may not be right for you at this time. Yes, exactly. You know? So that's exactly. very, very true. So Amy, can you share um, how people can find you? And I believe you have a really cool document you want to share about what's your accurate lab values and how to judge that what what labs you need to get and what's an optimal range not what you see on the lab so tell tell my listeners how to get a hold of you absolutely well first of all you can go to my website drlamyharneman.com and of course you can find me on all social platforms you know we're, we are everywhere so youtube instagram facebook all under dr amy horneman and then my podcast, which Betty is a guest on as well, the Thyroid Fixer podcast. So you can get a ton of information there as well as joining my private Facebook group, Girl Fix Your Thyroid, because you can post your labs. You can ask questions. I'm in there answering your questions. I'm in there reading your labs and giving you feedback. Now, of course, we can't give a diagnosis, but we can absolutely say, hey, you need to have your doctor test reverse T3. Hey, your free T is really low. So maybe we want to look at you know, having a conversation with your doctor or possibly working together because this is a disaster over here. So it's a great community that you can join and you get a ton of support from other thyroid members as well. I won't say thyroid suffers because many of them are optimized and they're just in there to help bring other people into optimization land. And the gift that I want to give, it's very important because we just rattled off a ton of different labs. We, I, I spewed out some optimal lab values and you, you're probably like, wait, what did she say again? I didn't write that down. So get the lab and symptom checklist. It's going to give you the labs to get. It's going to give you the functional optimal ranges. So just like I said earlier with free T3, we say 3.5 because that's where it lands on most labs. But then I also specify the upper quadrant of the range. And you're going to know all the different thyroid labs to get, even insulin and A1Cs on there so that you can know where you fall in that optimal range. And if you're not falling there, then maybe you need to dig a little bit deeper because that's giving you some immediate feedback right from your own blood, immediate feedback as to what maybe needs to bring be brought into the optimal lab value range. The second part is if you ask your doctor for those labs and your doctor says, no, it's time to get a new doctor because those labs are simple. They're not crazy. They're not wackadoodle. They're, I wouldn't even consider them functional labs. They're not like you know, a GI map test or a Dutch test. They're ju it's just blood. Go to Quest, go to LabCorp. All your doctor has to do is write it on a piece of paper and you go. Your doctor says no to labs, time to get a new doctor. I agree with that completely. You know, I, I remember I was, I, I, for years, I've done a lot of training with clinicians about putting functional medicine into their practice. And I said one time from the stage, I was like, you got to remember that medicine is a customer service business. And this doctor shot out of their chair like somebody had stuck him with a, you know, cattle prod. And they, they were like, I'm completely offended by this. And I was like, it is. Your patients are your customers. And if they aren't getting what they need from you and they don't have a partnership with you, they're going to choose differently, yep. you know, and especially the well-educated patient. So, you know, if your doctor is treating you as if this is a dictatorship, they need to go. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> they definitely need to go. Well, Amy, thank you so much for being on Menopause Mastery. We had so much fun talking and I'm sure we will talk again. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, Betty. All right, thanks.